Morning, everyone. So we're uh, concluding Romans 8 today. Um, Seems like quite a wee while, actually, that uh, we started this chapter, uh, one of the great chapters uh, of our Bibles, and we come to uh, the conclusion, the climax of, of this chapter today. So the reading is from Romans 8, 35 through to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. May God's Word warm and touch our hearts today uh, as we think about it. Now, this is less a sermon than it is a question and answer session, actually. Great, important questions, not only posed by Paul, uh, but also answered by him, not just left hanging as questions, but answers that are given as well. And uh, this is the last of the great questions and answers uh, that Paul raises for, for his readers. And he says, who shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? And there are kind of sub parts to that question, as we will see uh, later on. And uh, these are questions and answers for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that are well worth visiting and revisiting and reminding yourself about time and time and time again. Now, the point, of course, is that what is being said here is, is written fundamentally to believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, This is written to people who have placed their faith and all their confidence in Christ and in His finished work, as we've been thinking about in our singing. I mean, that's been the whole drift of this letter that Paul has so carefully composed under the inspiration of God's Spirit and had delivered and read out to these Roman Christians. Uh, His point has been about the importance of faith being placed in Christ. I mean, that is is the response that is being expected. That's the response that is being looked for when the gospel is proclaimed. The gospel that's the power of God to transform people's lives. The power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Because in this gospel, a righteousness of God from God is revealed, and that is a righteousness that is from faith to faith. That's chapter 1. From faith, from beginning to end, the great clarion call, the just, the righteous, will live by faith. If you're going to live, if you're going to be righteous, It will have to be with you having faith in Christ as your response. And so, the point that he's making here to the believers, the faithful, those who have placed their faith in Christ, the whole point of these question and answer sessions, if you like, is to give a cast iron sense of of certainty and of security, 
and of assurance and of confidence to them in the gospel of Christ and in the salvation that they enjoy and have received and that nothing will ever, no matter what it is, have the ability to separate these people from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so, I mean, there has to be the challenge that comes to us all once more this morning as we, as we think about this. Am I in that category of those who have placed faith in Christ? Because it's only if I find myself there that I come into the blessing and the assurance of these tremendous words that we're thinking about this morning. Has there been a point, a real point, that I can, I can go back to and I can remember when I have looked to Christ and I have believed that He is the Savior of the world, not just in a general sense, but the Savior for me. And I've placed all my confidence and all my trust in Christ. I believe in Him. And I believe in the importance of His death upon the cross to deal with my shortcomings and my sins against God. That is the only hope I have. I believe in Him. I have placed faith. That is the challenge that comes to us right at the outset. Now, as, as we go through this, there are, there are two kind of thoughts that kind of weave their way throughout this section that I'm going to try and just kind of hang my thoughts on today, um, and hopefully you'll find that of some use in, in, in just trying to remember it. And the two, the two words really are the word separation, first of all, and secondly, certainty. So let, let's think about this idea of separation, because of course what he's saying is that there is nothing that is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ, if we have faith uh, in Him. Now, one of the great, almost perennial temptations for people, even for Christian people, is to doubt the love of God. It is to have doubts that, that God loves them. I mean, maybe at, at one level, we, we accept that the God of heaven is a God of love in a general sense, that God is love. But, you know, especially when you look at the list that we have in front of us here, and, and, and for, for some of us, maybe, maybe that does describe some of my life events, when it talks about tribulation and distress and persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. And, and people can be tempted going through all of that and experiencing that to doubt whether God's love applies to them. They lose sight of that. They become a little bit loosed from their moorings as far as their belief in that is concerned. And they wonder, you know, because of this, does it mean somehow or another that I have displeased God? Am I, am I being punished in some sort of way? But is God angry with me because of what this is? And all these doubts, they come into our minds and, and we begin to wonder, am I being separated from the love of God at a personal level? Now, it is important just to make the, the general point, however, about the reality, about the certainty of God's love. I mean, from the, from the point of view of the, the way the Bible teaches this subject, there is absolutely no doubt. I mean, God in His very character is described as being love. God is love. And God has shown His love in so many different ways. And the clearest way, of course, that He has done that is in the coming of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. Now, of course, when we say God's Son, as I've frequently said in the past, we're not thinking of some sort of biological sense that we have sons and daughters. God in His greatness, His complexity, um, the one God is both Father, Son, and Spirit. And God comes and did come 
in the person of the Son into our world. You know, there's a point in history when that happened. It's all recorded. And the great verse that so many of us learned and love, and which for many is the best known verse in the whole of the Bible, expresses this so clearly when it says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I mean, it's almost, with that little word, so, it's almost as if there is an inadequacy in vocabulary in being able to fully describe the extent, you know, the depth, the, the profundity of God's love. He, he so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It doesn't say that God so loved the world that He cares for it every season, every day. He causes the the sun to rise and the sun to set, the tides to go out and in. He causes new birth. Uh, It doesn't say that. The fullest expression of His love is that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, we don't use that word very often, do we? Begotten. But it it does highlight the extent of God's love. The word begotten carries a number of ideas. It carries the idea of dearly loved. God's beloved Son. It carries the idea of His uniqueness, of the fact that He is is preeminent and that He surpasses everybody else. And it carries the idea as well uh, of His essential nature, that He is of the same essence as God Himself. He is begotten, not created. You remember there's a a Christmas carol that says that. God of God, light of light, He abhors not the virgin's womb. God of God, begotten, not created. O come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. And this is who is sent this is, the, this is the way that God so loves the world. It is to give His only begotten Son. And it's not just to give Him so that He lives among us as a man among other men. He gives Him to the death of the cross. I mean, in fact, when that great John 3.16 verse is, is placed in Scripture, It's placed there against the background of a historical incident when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Christ had to be lifted up. It was the only way that our sinful humanity could ever hope to escape perishing Christ had to be lifted up upon the cross as the Savior of the world and and sacrifice Himself because of His love for us. I mean, they said that when Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus. They watched Him, and they said, well, look how, how much He loved Him. They saw that was clear as the nose on your face that Christ loved Lazarus and He loved Martha and He loved Mary. They watched Him weep. I mean, for for us today, we look to the cross. We see Christ suffering and weeping and His anguish. And we should never forget how greatly God loves us. He gave His only begotten Son. Now, we can understand love in so many levels, so many great descriptions of that in in Scripture even. One of the ones that I've always found quite moving is, is the incident regarding David and his son, his son Absalom. Absalom, who was a disaster zone. Absalom, who, who would have killed his own father, who instigated a rebellion and a civil war. And yet, on the last battle, when when Absalom lost his life in the woods, a javelin through his heart, and word is brought back to David in the city, and he learns about Absalom. It's recorded that he, he, he climbs up the stairs 
above the city wall, and as he goes, he weeps. And this is what he says, O Absalom, my son Absalom, would God that I had died instead of you. O Absalom, my son, my son. Now that was remarkable, but we understand that. Father's love for his son. I remember a couple of years back, walking through a a military cemetery in France, looking at some of the inscriptions. And one of them has stuck with me ever since, and it read like this, to the world he was just one of many, but he was all the world to us. He was our boy. And we understand that. But what we are talking about today is the love of God for you and the love of God for me that He would give His only begotten Son to the death of the cross so that we might not perish but have everlasting life. And someone has well said, well said, we may die unsaved, we will never die unloved. You will never die unloved because God loves you. God loves you so much He was prepared to give His only begotten Son so that we might not perish but have everlasting life. Now, the question, of course, is this. Have I responded to the love of Christ? Have I been touched by that? I mean, there's a passage in the book of uh, Lamentations. You know, it's, it's a lament, obviously, on the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah, the prophet who writes it, at one point he says, he says, is it, is it nothing to you? All you that pass by, look, look and see, and behold the sorrow that I have because of the destruction of Jerusalem and what's happened to the people and all the lost hope and everything else, does it mean nothing to you as you pass by and watch me weep? For many people, I'd have to say, they hear the story of Christ's love for them, and it doesn't touch their heart. It doesn't move them. They think it's a fantasy. They think this is just some sort of legend. They don't think it applies to them. They think this is irrelevant. This is, this is the message of God for every generation and for every person that's ever walked this, this earth of ours, that God loves you, and He sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And He wants you to open your heart to His love, not to close it. You know that great verse in Revelation? He pictures Himself as standing at the door and knocking of a church in that particular occasion. But we apply that to ourselves as individuals. Christ stands in front of us. Let me in. You know, people had been described as having lost this sense of their love for Christ. Let me in. Open the door. There's nothing so sad as as unrequited love. I was thinking of the parable of the prodigal son. The father, waiting all these years, his boy had gone into that lost, faraway country, just wasted things completely. His father waited every day. Now, thankfully, that boy went back. He returned and found his father, despite all that he had done, willing to embrace him, willing to welcome him back. Just imagine if he'd sat as he found himself in that pigsty, you know, destitute with nothing, and thinking, I know my father loves me. Uh, I know he's there. I just feel that everything that I've done, the attitudes I've had, my lifestyle, it's just unsurmountable. He he, He could never overlook that. He could never welcome me back. I could never take my role again back. I could never look him in the eye. Because of what I've done, he won't be interested. He won't forgive me. The message of Scripture is this. Separation. You know, nothing, if we're a child of God, can separate us. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. 
And for those who are not saved here today, open your heart to the love of Christ. You know, there's nothing just quite so sad as that word separation, isolation. I think one of the most difficult things about this period of of lockdown has been stories of people who've, who've, who did die alone in hospital without family members being able to sit beside them and, and hold their hand. Or these pictures of elderly people in care homes, you know, reaching out, touching glass between them and their family members, separated, isolated. Separation from God separation from the love of God. And we can think about the things that are mentioned here, and we can think about how, you know, maybe, maybe any one of these things could cause that separation from God's love to be experienced by me. I was thinking about the story of Joseph in our Old Testament. Because of the wickedness and the deceptiveness of his brothers, for years, Joseph was separated from his father. His father actually thought he was dead. And he was separated from him. Nothing can separate the child of God from God's love. There's a tremendous verse, actually. You may want to jot this one down and read, read this one during the course of the week. It's found in uh, Isaiah and in chapter 49. And this is what it says. It's at verse 15. It says, can a, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even those may forget Yet I will not forget you. I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. I mean, you you would think that would be highly unusual for a mother to forget her nursing child. And yet it happens. We know it happens. We've all heard the news stories. We know it can take place. God said, I'll never forget you. Your name, your details are engraven on the palms of my hand indelibly, and they will never be erased. The child of God can never be separated from God's love. There's a psalm, of course, that is quoted here in our chapter, in Romans chapter 8, to make that point, to give us another example about this issue of separation. For your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as as sheep to be slaughtered. That that psalm is uh, Psalm number 44, by the way. You might want to just turn to that as well, just now, just just to really get the point of why he uses that psalm. Because this, this psalm, well, it's actually written by the sons of Korah. You know, they, they had a bad history, a bad family history. Their, their, fa- their father was a bad guy. And yet here they are, and they're, they're brought back into the, the worship of, of God. They know something of God's mercy. And, and look at how it all starts off here. Oh God, we've, we've heard with our ears, and our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days. So it talks about God's goodness to their fathers in the past. And then verse 9, but, but you've rejected us, and you've not gone out with our armies. Verse 17, and all this has come upon us, although we've not forgotten you, and although we've not been false to your covenant, and our hearts have not turned back. So, I mean, the point is this. 
he's bewildered. He's confused. He doesn't understand this. We know, we know how, how God has been so good in the past. And we're trying to be faithful. And as far as we're concerned, we don't detect the fact that we're willfully turning our backs to God. Our hearts are trying to be true. And yet, and yet this is so difficult. And so what does he do at the end? He says, you know, we're, we're being killed. We're being slaughtered here. And we've done nothing wrong. And he cries out to God. He pours out his heart to God. I feel him abandoned. I feel him separated from your love. I can't see it. I can't feel it anywhere. The very final verse of the psalm, 26. Come to our help. Rise up. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. And what he holds on to, despite everything, at the end of it all, is the reality of God's steadfast, unfailing love. And that's what we have here. And Paul's great answer to this question about separation is absolutely Clear, clear as crystal. See that? Verse 37. He says, no. What he says is this. I am, I'm certain. He said, I am, I am sure. I am persuaded. And he goes through this whole list, this second list, that there will be nothing ever able to separate us from the love of God. But, but look at how he puts it in verse 37. He says, no, in all these things. See that? His prayer is not, and his, his understanding is not that I should pray that God takes me out of this or that God never lets me come into this. But what he's saying is, in these things, walking through the middle of all of these things, experiencing them as I do, it's in it that I am more than a conqueror because I have the belief and I have the knowledge that God loves me. That's what, well, it it doesn't just sustain me. It just doesn't help me survive. It helps me conquer. In fact, the word, the original idea of this word that is translated more than conqueror is it allows me to be a super conqueror. That kind of conqueror. To be absolutely triumphant despite my circumstances because I have the knowledge that I will never be separated from the love of God. God's love is the deep, deep love of Jesus. It's all around me surrounds me. It's the measureless dimensions of God's love. And, and for, for, for you, Christian, today, to, for us all to try and just grasp this and believe it again, the depths of Christ's love for us from beginning to end and every day, despite the difficulties and trials of the lives that we have. It's a wonderful verse in the Old Testament that says that many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. Now, that was originally written by Solomon, and it was originally written to do with romantic love, and we can understand that, but it finds its deeper fulfillment in the love of Christ for His people. It doesn't matter what the floods are doesn't matter what the problems are. doesn't matter about your own inconsistencies and your failures. Many waters will never quench the love of Christ. The floods will not drown it. Now let's come to that second word. We're moving on from the idea of separation uh, to certainty. I am sure 
verse 38. I have no doubt. I am absolutely convinced. I am totally persuaded. I am certain that neither death nor life, angels or rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is in no doubt at all about this. Let's just look at some of the categories that he's talked about. We might think that, that death might separate us at times from the love of God. I spoke to somebody recently. Um, their, their grandmother had just died, age 96. They've been married for 73 years. I don't think I've ever known of somebody who's been married as long as that. 73 years. And I uh, said that his grandfather was very upset, obviously, and said, she's not coming back. I'm not going to see her again after 73 years. Can death separate us from the love of Christ? I mean, this is the great hope. I'd ha I want to say this, the great hope of the believer that the, the, the gospel, you see, is not just described in terms of, you know, I will be satisfied in this life. It will give me a sense of joy. I will be blessed. I mean, that's true. But fundamentally, the way the gospel is described is in terms of what happens after we die. And we're all going to die. You know, the, these brief lives of ours, like a vapor, you know, like a a weaver's shuttle. Is that not one of the ways in which the, the Scripture describes our life? These old days when the, the shuttle used to go round in the weaver's loom and the, the thread was very quickly done up and our lives are just like that at times. Flash past. We come to the end and there's death. And what happens after death? I mean, that's, that was the point of John 3.16 again, wasn't it? That we shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. There's the reality that, that we might perish in our sins. Jesus said that to people. You will die in your sin. You'll die in your sin without having your sin resolved. And where I am, you will not be. You cannot come. If you die in your sins, you will perish. I mean, Paul's great concern in this book is for his own people, his, his national identity with fellow Jews, fellow Israelites. If you look at chapter 10, verse 1, he says, you know, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is that they might be saved. More than anything else, I want them to be saved. And look at how he puts it if you flick back to chapter 9 and verse 2. He said, I've got great sorrow in my heart. I've got unceasing anguish in my heart. And I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. I mean, the way that he describes that, he's almost saying, you know, if it was possible for me to take their place. And, and, and the way he describes that is being cut off from Christ. It is being separated from Christ. He says, that, that's, that's what lies before them. That's why I have this anguish. And that's why I pray for them. Because I know that as things stand, they reject Christ. They said at the cross, we won't have this man to rule over us. And they crucify away with him. And that means that for those who reject, they will be separated from the love of Christ. 
Now that, you, you know how I've been trying to make this point today for the, for the believer and how we can't be separated from the love of Christ. But for those who reject Christ today, and when we die, you will be separated from Him and from His love. I mean, recently his secretary phoned me up, let me know about uh, an elderly gentleman who'd, who'd passed away, and she'd received a letter from an email from one of the daughters, and, and she, she, she'd hardly speak down the phone. You know, she was moved, and he's at rest now. He's with the stars now. Now, that may very well be the case if he's a believer in Christ. But the reality of the thing is this, that although for many of us, you know, we've got this kind of schizophrenic attitude, and at one level, you know, we say, we don't believe the Bible, we don't believe that God created us, we don't believe in Christ, and yet when people and relatives die, this is the kind of language that's used. You know, they're with the angels, they're with the stars, they're looking down on us. And for the vast majority, according to the teaching of the Bible, that is not the case. They are not at rest. They are not in heaven. They are not with Christ. The love of God is something that they have spurned and never opened their heart to, and they are now separated from all of that. They are perishing. But God has so loved the world that He's given His only begotten Son so that if we believe in Him. And the point is, it's all my confidence in Christ. Do I rely on, on his, his finished work? Am I persuaded? Am I certain in that? That's where Paul is bringing us to. Certainty, faith, belief. Does the birth of Christ persuade you that God loves you? That God sent His Son to Bethlehem? That tremendous mystery, that wonderful event when God was manifest in flesh? Does the teaching of Christ convince you, persuade you, the prodigal son? Does the, does the death of Christ upon the tree at Calvary, the Son of God, crown of thorns, mocked, stripped, impaled, brutally upon the cross, does that persuade you that God loves you and to open your heart and respond to the love of God? That's where he comes to here. That the, I am persuaded, and I'm persuaded that none of these things, whatever they are, whether it's demons whether it's my life now or anything that might happen to me in the future, any kind of power, whether that's governmental power or people who, have, who are powerful, individuals, there is nothing, comprehensive statement, in all creation that will ever be able to separate the child of God from His love. So there we have it. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. It's for all of us who receive the Lord Jesus to have and carry away with us today this great sense of certainty in His love for us. And it's a challenge for those who are not yet saved to respond and open our hearts to what He's done. May God bless His Word, and shall we pray? So, Lord, we make our prayer, as, as Paul did, for our own people, our heart's desire, our prayer to God, is that they might be saved. Lord, the reality of Your, your love for us in Christ has been brought before our attention. For, for those who are Your children, May the, the, the tremendous reassurance give us real confidence and a sense of certainty 
as we live our lives in difficult times. And for those who as yet have never placed faith in our Lord Jesus, may the warmth and the reality and the demonstration of your love to us melt our hearts and help us to respond in faith and to welcome Christ into our hearts. And so we ask a blessing upon us all today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.